Hello, and welcome to the Port of Los Angeles November Media Briefing. I'm Philip Sanfield, the Port's Communications Director, and with me, as always, is Executive Director Gene Soroka. Greetings, Hello, Gene. Philip, and thank you all for joining us today, especially on this Friday as we head into the Thanksgiving week. We'll do our best to make good use of our time here together. I'll begin, as usual, with a monthly update, and then we'll welcome today's guest, Steve Hughes, President and CEO of HCS International. Steve and his consulting firm are recognized as leading voices in the automotive industry. They're especially known for their expertise in supply chain matters co concerning ocean shipping. Steve's ongoing work for the Department of Commerce and the Federal Maritime Commission have given him a unique perspective into challenges facing both importers and exporters in today's market. I'm looking forward to the conversation and of course, we'll both be available to answer your questions. Gene, let's begin with our October volume. Please take us through the key data points. Philip, we had a solid start to the fourth quarter as we handled 725,000 plus container units in October. That represents a 7% gain over last year and marks the third consecutive month of year-over-year -year improvement. Both imports and exports have shown growth over the last year, and I expect to see the trend continue in the months ahead. On the inbound side here in Los Angeles, we processed 372,000 20-foot equivalent units. That's 11% more than we did last year. Notably, in the last three months, August through October, the San Pedro Bay ports increased their market share of U.S. containerized imports from Asia, rising from 46% compared to last year's 42%. Although still lots of room to improve here, we're starting to see more cargo headed back our way. The driving force behind these rising imports continues to be the robust state of our nation's economy. There was good news on the inflation front this week. The consumer price index declined to an annualized rate of 3.2% through October. That's the lowest annual rate in more than two years. And the third quarter GDP exceeded expectations, reaching an annualized growth rate of 4.9%. So, despite the concerns about inflation and interest rates, the resilience of the American consumer remains strong. I've discussed the rise of U.S. exports in recent months, and that positive trend continued in October. The Port of Los Angeles moved 121,000 export container units last month, a 35% increase over last year's very soft October. That's the fifth consecutive month of year-on-year -year growth in exports. And our import-to-export ratio in Los Angeles stands at a very healthy 3.1 to 1, the best we've seen in years. It's worth mentioning that just two years ago, during the import surge, that ratio was double, 6.2 imports for every one container exported. So after years of very low export trade, it is encouraging to see the trend begin to reverse. And finally, empty containers headed back to Asia came in at about 232,000 units. That's down 8% from last October. Fewer empties make it more accessible and cost-effective for U.S. exporters to transport their cargo on vessels back. So overall, considering this year's light peak season, October was a good month at the Port of Los Angeles. Thank you, Gene. Let's shift now to our year-to-date volume and how you see 2023 playing out. Philip, with two months left in the year, the Port of Los Angeles has moved about 7.1 million container units. As most of you know, global trade was light during the first half of the year, particularly at the West Coast ports due to the protracted labor negotiations. Following a very slow start in quarter one, we've really been picking up the pace with a lot of cargo after that. We've cut our year-on-year -year deficit in half from 32% down to 16% right now, and that'll continue to improve over the last six weeks of the year. Already, November is shaping up to be one of our strongest months of 2023. Our data indicates that we'll handle about 800,000 TEUs as we see both a final holiday push and some warehouse replenishment beginning to happen. The National Retail Federation expects to see record levels of spending this holiday season, with an estimated growth of between 3 and 4% 
compared to last year's big numbers. And while October retail sales dipped slightly at 0.1%, it was less than many economists projected. To gauge consumer demand, we'll be looking closely at next week's Black Friday sales numbers. Meanwhile, we're closing out the year with the return of one of our shipping lines back here to the Port of Los Angeles. Zim Integrated Shipping Services recently announced the relaunch of its expedited 12 and a half day service from South China direct to Los Angeles. This service was suspended back in March due to low demand. And we're pleased to welcome Zim and its e-commerce express service back to the Port of LA, which offers the fastest, most efficient route for trade with Asia. As we wrap up 2023, all of our operational vital signs, including cargo velocity, vessel arrivals, and dwell times for both rail and trucks remain in really good shape. LA's terminal operators, best-in-class labor force, and logistics providers have the capacity and ability to scale quickly as demand dictates. Very good, Gene. Thank you. And now it's time for today's guest, as you know him quite well, would yeah, you like to do the honors? Course. Steve Hughes has been a presence in the automotive aftermarket industry since 1973. Steve took a significant step forward in 1987 when he founded his own consulting company, HCS International. Over the course of his career, Steve worked with major auto parts suppliers as well as both domestic and international manufacturers. Steve also sits on the FMC's Shipper Advisory Committee, representing both the Motor Equipment Manufacturers Association and the Auto Care Association. With his extensive experience, Steve is completely dialed into the challenges and opportunities in ocean shipping. We're fortunate to have Steve joining us today from just around the San Pedro Bay in Palos Verdes, California. Steve, great to see you, my friend. Uh, great to see you, Gene, as always. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you today. I'm, I'm very honored. Steve, let's start off. Your focus is in the auto aftermarket. For those not familiar with the industry, give us an overview of its size and scope as well as how you operate. Well, let me set the stage so every, everyone understands the uh, what the aftermarket is versus the rest of the industry. You have the two segments of the auto industry. You have the vehicle manufacturers and the subset of the parts manufacturers that actually supply them. The vehicle manufacturers sell their cars and parts typically through new car dealerships. Um, the automotive aftermarket is basically everything outside the new car uh, dealers. This includes independent automotive repair shops, tire shops, gas stations, oil and lube shops, body shops, all the various parts stores, warehouse distributors, and of course, the large importers that bring the parts in. The automotive aftermarket is actually a huge and commonly underestimated segment of our economy. And here's the interesting bit. The automotive aftermarket represents $477.6 billion of the U.S. economy. There are 539,000 businesses employing 4.77 million automotive professionals. This covers light, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles. And breaking that down, there are 284 million light vehicles, uh, which consist of cars and light-duty trucks. Uh, and that represents $360 billion of the, uh, of the market. And then there's 9.48 million vehicles are classified under medium and heavy-duty vehicles, which are typically your delivery vans in the overall trucking industry, and that represents $117.2 billion of the market. Now, underlying the market are the parts manufacturers, both domestic and overseas, who supply wholesale job or independent parts stores, along with retail chains and mass merchandisers. These various entities supply over 263,000 independent repair facilities, and the 16,700 plus new car dealerships run by the 915,000 technicians scattered across the country. The reason we include the new car dealerships is because they also do non-warranty work that um, and often purchase their parts, aftermarket parts, to support these repairs. So how do these numbers relate to the automotive aftermarket uh, parts industry and ocean shipping? 
I don't have the exact number, but a lo very large percentage of these parts are imported from overseas manufacturers in Asia, Europe, and Latin America. And if I were to hazard a guess, uh, I would estimate that percentage somewhere in the region of 85 to 90 percent of the product is imported. So very briefly, how does the aftermarket work? Typically, parts are imported from the above mentioned international markets by retailers or importers, warehouse distributors. From there, parts are sold to other distribution sources, including the local parts stores who sell to repair shops or directly to consumers who are doing repairs themselves still. That's a lot to take in, and it shows just how complex this retail supply chain goes all the way back to Asia and how it's so important to all of us. So from that supply chain perspective, Steve, what's the current projected outlook for the auto industry, including the aftermarket sector, as it comes down into this port business? Well, we're on the verge of returning to uh, pre-COVID normality, if you will. So. Uh, you're probably thinking, aren't we back to normal by now? But simply put, in many cases, no. To understand where we currently are, we need to go back to the end of the pandemic uh, and the huge surge in uh, uh, consumer spending. Even though most rational minds understood this was unsustainable, purchasing executives were forced to order based upon historic demand because nobody could reliably forecast when there'd be a return to more normal consumer spending. In January, February of 22, we started to see the lines of, of supply versus demand converge and then pass each other. This is an important point. At the same time, the very large backup of purchase orders on the supply side started to be shipped, and we had that, that huge surge of shipping. Um, and those those ended up uh, showing up at the warehouses and completely overloading them because the the uh, demand side dropped so severely um, and all the manufacturers were shipping upwards of purchase orders that were a year old. Um, within a couple of months, some companies were reporting two to three years of on-hand inventories. And I can't begin to tell you what kind of financial strain this put on those companies. But these inventories were loaded with extremely high freight costs of as much as 20 times the normal pre-COVID rates, as you know. And it's important to note that our industry uses an average cost basis. Um, so with that in mind, 14 months ago, freight rates plummeted back to a normalized level, but the inventory levels were huge, hugely inflated. So nobody was ordering anything uh, because they were burning through their stocks. Now consider that for a company's inventory costs to go down due to lower freight costs, they have to receive new parts at the lower freight costs, which are then spread across the total. Unfortunately, high inventory costs don't change until you begin to run low on inventory and start the replenishment process with new inventory. But this can take 12 to 18 months or more before you see a significant reduction in your inventory and your lower landed costs. So, Anecdotally, we're now hearing in the industry that inventory levels are at that inflection point are starting to get back to normal levels, which you'll start to see more cargo coming in. Some inventory, some estimates that is predicted levels, inventory levels will be fully normalized by the first or second um, quarter of next year. So you'll start to see a more consistent return of ordering. At the same time, since the freight rates are down to pre-COVID levels, average costs on inventories will start to drop. In fact, we're starting to see the effect of these average costs going down already. So what do I mean by that? Um, I've been warning our industry since the inception of the skyrocketing freight rates that once rates start to drop and inventory levels and landed costs start to normalize, competitive market pressures will effectively start a race to the bottom on pricing. In fact, we're already starting to see this. Um, and then anecdotally outside of my industry, I've already heard of this happening in the agriculture segment. So I think it's going to be very interesting watching market pricing fluctuates in the fluctuations that is in the next six to nine months. Um, as for what we're gonna see in 2024, there are indications that the economy is starting to slow a little bit, at least from manufacturing is down and demand from what we're seeing is, is softening. And, I, and Gene, maybe you can correct me, I believe the NRF uh, recently downgraded their forecast for 24. Um, 
But typically, the automotive aftermarket thrives in a down economy. Uh, when the economy starts slowing, people stop buying cars and they repair their cars. Uh, so maintenance goes up, which is good for the aftermarket. And I do expect the automotive aftermarket to stay strong in 24 and an increase in shipments. That's good to hear. Yes, and over the last couple of days, we've also gotten some good news in the broader automotive industry. Just this morning, we got uh, word that Stellantis, known for its Dodge and Chrysler brands, their workers ratified the new UAW contract with the United Auto Workers. And just a couple of days ago, General Motors workers ratified that contract. So we're encouraged. You know, and the automotive business broadly is so important to this port of Los Angeles with more than $25 billion dollars worth of automotive goods that move through our gateway. And in, in working with the OEMs and the tiered suppliers over my career, Steve, just-in-time delivery in the automotive sector is absolutely huge from a manufacturing standpoint. When it comes to the certainty of the supply chain, how does it look for the aftermarket auto parts? Well, um, you know, when you're talking just-in-time uh, delivery of auto parts, uh, I'd say that the uh, it, it doesn't apply to uh, the aftermarket, but then again, it does. It's not quite the same in the, in the aftermarket industry. In auto manufacturing, if a delivery is late, it's very possible that a production line uh, shuts down because normally there are no options for them. That's not the case with the aftermarket. It's, if a delivery is late and you're out of stock, you lose a sale and your customer will go call your competitor who will usually pick up a sale. But at the very same time, much like uh, GIT or uh, just in time, the typical mentality of aftermarket suppliers is to churn the, their inventory as frequently as possible throughout the year. And ideally, you want to um, be running out of inventory the, the day that your replacements hit the shelf. With that said, most companies want to build in some sort of safety stock to accommodate increases in demand or the occasional spike in sales when your competitors are out of stock. That's really so important to understand, Steve, because like most of this work that you and I do, it's complex, it's nuanced, and the answers are, it depends. But understanding these market segments make us better attuned to our customers. Finally, you're the member, you're on a member of the National Shipper Advisory Committee tasked by the FMC with examining issues that both importers and exporters face with respect to ocean shipping. And this is a group of a lot of big thinkers. What's the focus right now? And I know you just got back and, and spent some time with our, our mutual friends back in DC. Well, b before I answer that question, I'd like to speak a bit about our committee. If you look at the members of our committee, you'll see some of the very best and brightest individuals in the industry uh, representing some of the top businesses and trade associations in the country. And I have to say that every time I sit down with these guys, I learn something. Uh, but equally important, the balance and fairness towards the shipping industry that everyone exhibits in their suggestions and comments and our recommendations is remarkable. And I am very proud and honored to be working with such an outstanding group of individuals. Um, with that in mind, um, our committee has made quite a few recommend recommendations to the commission. Uh, I'll, I'll try and read through uh, them uh, quickly. They're uh, fairly compact. These, these are my uh, abbreviations of them, so. Uh, first one is intermodal oversight via through bills of lading. This is rail storage and rail demerge, which really um, is a contentious issue for BCOs. There's an undis undisputed gap in authority when it comes to oversight and rail demerge issued when there's a through bill of lading. We ask for expanding the scope of the FMC to include oversight of rail carriage and related charges for through bills of lading. This gives BCOs and an authority to which they can file and arbitrate a dispute. Um, the STB, the Surface Transportation Board, which uh, oversees the rails, uh, are prevented from um, uh, making these kinds of decisions due to the Staggers Act and two other two other uh, laws. And the FMC is uh, is conflicted whether they have authority or not, uh, if, depending upon which commission you speak to. Uh, dwell fees, we ask for regulation in concert with the interpretive rule that prevents unreasonable application of charges on, on uh, containers. Uh, 
Early receiving dates. This is a very contentious issue for exporters. We all recognize that ERDs quite often change with little or no notice. Catching out the exporters resulting in unfair and, un and added fees and charges. Uh, we're recommending to codify regulation in concert, again, with the interpretive rule that prohibits any unreasonable application of charges on containers for ERD changes, document cut dates and cargo cut dates while shifting the burden of proof to vessel operators and strengthening requirements for a, a reasonable and timely dispute resolution. Uh, we did uh, suggest that uh, another advisory committee of the uh, ocean carriers be uh, established. And that was really so we had uh, our committee could talk to all of the carriers in one spot instead of having to have all these individual conversations. Um, data, and this is an important one, as you know so well, Gene, uh, there's several recommendations made by the data group that are basically require ocean carriers to align and make consistent shipment and container level da data along with intermodal data alignment for all to see. Um, government inspections. We're, we're seeking consideration into practice of liner and uh, terminal storage to merge detention uh, imposed on containers that have been held, delayed, or otherwise detained outside of the control of the cargo owner. Uh, we want to codify a regulation that requires fees related to random government inspections to be charged on a reduced scale, 25% of the tariff, to cover the costs of the carriers and MTOs, but not to be putative to the shippers, which are the cargoes being held without, uh, um, without uh, you know, this isn't something they want, obviously. So there's no in incentive uh, uh, to them getting it out. Or, and then there's, uh, we did make a uh, comment to the detention and demerge uh, notice of both rulemaking or the NPRM to expand the definition of D&D &D to mean any charges, including per diem, assessed by or on behalf of ocean carriers, marine terminal operators, or vessel um, operating common carriers related to the use of terminal space or shipping containers, but not including freight charges. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. Well, we're grateful for the work that you and the others are doing. I know Ken O'Brien from Gemini back in New York is a, another strong participant in this area. Uh, Rebecca Dye, Commissioner FMC, Dan Maffei, the, the current chair, everybody's chipping in. And we've learned so much over the past several years. We got to get this kind of work out there and doing it the right way and just try to keep improving this great supply chain. It is tedious. It's difficult. It has stops and starts, but we really appreciate all the work you're doing here, Steve. Thanks a bunch. Philip, back over to you well, for questions from the media. Thank you, Gene. <clears throat> we've, we've received several questions in advance. Uh, for those, anyone who'd like to submit one now for either Steve or Gene, please use the Q&A box below and remember to include your name and affiliation. Gene, let's start with you. A few questions have come in about the closure of the I-10 freeway near downtown Los Angeles due to a major fire. Are we seeing impacts at- Yeah, Philip, first of all, I'd like to share that just last night, California Governor Gavin Newsom announced that this stretch of the 10 freeway at the southern part of downtown Los Angeles will reopen next Tuesday, November 21st, weeks ahead of estimated schedules as the authorities began to unravel the devastation that these fires created for the city of LA. And I've got to thank our Los Angeles Fire Department Chief and, and my friend, Kristen Crowley, for all the work that she and the members of her organization have done, along with the first responders to keep harm's way out of downtown LA and get this, get this area safe for the workers to begin their restoration project. And both Governor Newsom, as well as Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass, have been on top of this since day one last weekend. Incredible leadership by both. Our mayor has been getting up 
2, 30, 3 o'clock every single morning, surveying the traffic patterns, reporting out to the people of Los Angeles and the region, trying to help divert that traffic away from the affected area, encouraging companies to allow employees to telecommute, and, and making sure that our neighborhoods aren't overtly impacted. And I know one of our great established neighborhoods in East Los Angeles, Boyle Heights, has seen a lot of surface traffic happening that normally isn't there and impacting our school buses and commuters and our neighborhoods and houses. And that will come to an end in the days ahead. And we really appreciate that community standing by with every, every ounce of, of what they've done so far as well. Thus far, back here at the port, Terminal operators, truckers, and our other stakeholders are reporting to us that the operations are relatively normal in and around the port complex, and thanks to that, that early information. But we're monitoring this situation closely because there's always going to be something with traffic in LA, and this, this issue just simply exacerbates that. But so far, the region is operating very fluidly. And please remember, for this stretch of the 10 freeway at the southern part of the city of Los Angeles, some 300,000 vehicles use the 10 every single day. Our friend Matt Schrapp and the Harbor Trucking Association reported that it was that advanced notification and communication coming from the governor, from the mayor, from State Secretary of Transportation, Toksoma Shokin, who was on the ground right away here in Los Angeles. The alternative routes have really helped the truckers avoid major traffic issues. Now, some of the drivers are reporting to us that they're having difficulty getting from home to their depots, to their drayage trucks, and back at night. But all in all, we're trying to keep our finger on the pulse on this, and that cargo continues to flow. Relatively normal, but it's a fluid situation, and we'll keep folks posted from our vantage point down here. But I encourage you to continue to pay attention to Secretary Omashak and Governor Newsom and Mayor Bass's reports that are happening on a regular basis. Next question is from Lisa Bartline from Reuters, and it's for Steve. Steve, have you seen any significant drop in auto parts flowing out of China, i.e. is reshoring more talk than action? To say the least, um, when you start taking into account the added costs of, of reshoring, uh, much higher labor rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, reshoring isn't typically an option. Um, and the other thing about uh, um, uh, changing vendors, uh, changing countries of origin, et cetera, this is a process in, in the automotive industry that isn't something that you can do overnight. Typically, when you change vendors, or vet new vendors, it can take upwards of two years. So there's a there's a long vetting process uh, to do it properly. Uh, there is some um, some reshoring, uh, but it's it's limited to uh, a few specific products. Uh, we are seeing some um, nearshoring in Mexico. Uh, we're seeing a, a fair bit of that. Um, and and moving into other parts of Asia. So you're seeing a little bit into Vietnam, you're seeing a lot into to India, uh, but they all they all have their individual challenges. And China's going to be, for the automotive side, it's going to be still a strong player for a while. Very good. Um, Lisa's following up with you, Steve, with one more question. Are freight rates dropping and are ocean rates back to pre-pandemic levels or even below that? Oh, yeah. So uh, pre-pandemic levels, uh, we, we hit those almost a year ago. We were really within within a range about a year ago. Uh, so we've had these the great the, the normalized rates, if you will. Uh, for a while now. The problem has been, from our industry at least, with all this overstock, there hasn't been a lot of ordering. They've been burning down their inventories. So that's why I was saying earlier, we're going to start seeing more, more imports on our, on our uh, industry uh, now that inventories are starting to normalize. normalize. Very good. Uh, next question, Steve, is uh, for you from Alejandra Salgado from Supply Chain Dive. How are electric vehicles and EV batteries affecting how automakers and suppliers, uh, stores and process, uh, how they process vehicles, batteries and related parts during transport? I know that uh, um, uh, there's some companies that are very, very concerned about and there's making some changes. Um, 
the uh, uh, we've had a spate of of car fires recently in in uh, railroads in in um, uh, shipping the cars from uh, specifically from Europe. So uh, the unfortunate part is is when you have an EV fire, uh, they're they're very very difficult to put out. Um, and when you're on board a ship, it's it's worse um, as we can see from from a recent example. Uh, so they're trying to find better ways and safer ways to store the ship, the uh, cars, uh, the batteries. I, I'm, I'm sure they're they're trying to do the same thing. Uh, I'm I'm not aware of any incidences or any processes that they're putting in place for those. For those. Thank you, Gina. Questions come in from uh, Alicia with World Journal. And she's asking, how do you see President Xi and, and President Biden's meeting at APEC? Will this meeting improve trade between China and the United States? You know, it's interesting because there's been a lot of work over the, uh, the recent months. Uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen visited China some months back. Uh, Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo also had a, uh, had a visit. And just this week up in San Francisco, as widely reported, uh, President Biden and President Xi visited uh, south of San Francisco at Woodland uh, for more than four hours, along with high-level officials from both sides, cabinet members and ministers, to talk about our relationship and trade going forward. I thought the tone of the conversations that were made public were very good. Uh, President Biden spoke at a reception in San Francisco on uh, Wednesday evening that I attended, and he was upbeat at the APEC summit. And uh, President Xi's comments uh, to a group of uh, business leaders that night uh, was also very upbeat. So I'm encouraged. They're the world's two largest economies. A cooperation together is important, but there are a lot of issues that both sides face that they have to work together on. And I think the, uh, the resultant effect and the optics of these two world leaders sitting and talking for so long here uh, outside the great city of San Francisco was super encouraging. Please remember that here at the Port of Los Angeles, more than half of our business uh, originates or is destined to China. Uh, it's an extremely important trading partner for us, not just today, but for the years to come. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Gene, we've had a few questions come in about uh, zero emission funding. The ports of LA and Long Beach recently announced $60 million in available funding for vouchers toward the purchase of ZE trucks operating at the port complex. Do you see this jumpstarting the truck industry towards ZE well, trucks? Well, that's the plan, Philip, but we'll have to see. I'm super excited about the partnerships that we've developed with the California Air Resources Board, California Climate Investments, and CalSTART as part of California's specific incentive program around zero emission trucks and bus vouchers. The ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles are providing $60 million in funding, 30 million from each port toward the purchase of zero emission class eight heavy duty drayage trucks that operate here at the San Pedro Bay port complex. Combined with state money, a voucher now could be worth up to a quarter million dollars per big rig. We make these vouchers a little bit more attractive for smaller companies, but still they're very good for the larger trucking companies that service our ports. And just with simple mathematics, this funding that the two ports are putting up right now, along with our California based partners could deploy up to 800 new zero emissions trucks. So we're going to keep pushing. Now, the current landscape of trucking is very interesting here in Southern California for the port business. We have more than 20,000 trucks registered to do business here at the ports. About half of those call on a regular basis. We call it weekly. But of the 20,000 trucks, some 16,000 are 2014 model year or newer diesel trucks. Another 4,000 are 2010 model year or newer, complying fully with state of California laws. But we want to go further than that. There are currently 500 trucks that are of near zero variety moving cargo here at the ports. And there are a little more than 150 pure zero emission trucks testing out and doing business here at the ports right now.
So as you can see from those numbers, more than 20,000 trucks registered and about 150 of those are zero emissions right now, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. But I will tell you this, as I've repeated in many forums and in public before, our resolve has never been stronger to get to our quest of a zero emissions ports. Thank you. Next question is for Steve. It's from Eric Watkins at Cargomatic. How do you feel that the FMC is doing now after being given some teeth through the Ocean Shipping Reform Act? Are inequities on ocean shipping being adequately addressed? Uh, that's a great question. Um, well, the, the, the charge complaint uh, uh, process has uh, made it easier for, for cargo owners to file complaints, and there's record numbers of complaints being processed now. Uh, so on that side, it's good uh, uh, that there was that opportunity. Um, and the complaint process is, is easier for the smaller BCOs too. Um, but on the other side, you know, we, we've, got, uh, we've got these recommendations that we've made and uh, we wish that, they, that uh, they could be pushed through quicker. Uh, what you have is you've got 24 um, highly successful, very results-driven executives working uh, for the FMC on the National Shipper Advisory Committee. Um, these, are, these are people that get results and expect results. So when we make recommendations, uh, we're frustrated by the speed at which the government works. And, and that's an, always going to be an issue. Um, we do have the new demerge and detention rule that uh, we've been told is imminent. Um, and we're, we're really excited to see what they've taken from our recommendations and what they're going to put into that rule. And I, I think that will help a lot. Um, but there's more teeth in the in a, uh, from Azra, but uh, there still needs we still need more work. Good. Uh, Eric is following up with a question for Gene. Gene, more cargo is coming to the West Coast now. There's water issues at the Panama Canal. The possibility of labor actions on the East Coast. Is Los Angeles prepared to handle surges in car cargo, particularly with new environmental regulations in 2024 that could limit the number of drayage trucks in California? Thanks for joining again, Eric. In short, yes, we are. We're running about 70% of capacity right now, but what your question illustrates is every day here at the Port of LA and, and ports across the country, there are so many issues in the supply chain that we grapple with, opportunities that we have to capitalize on. And yes, there are questions still in the supply chain as you outlined and many more, but running at the capacity we are right now, we've got the ability to scale up. As I mentioned specifically on the trucking area with more than 20,000 big rigs registered, and about half of those they call regularly, you know, we have that scalability to bring more, more activity here to the port. So I'm confident. And with the regulations, you know, again, the new clean truck fleet rule uh, by the California Air Resources Board states that beginning on January 1st of 2024, any new truck that wants to do drayage business at the port must be registered and be the equivalent to a zero emissions truck. So we've got to continue to do what we can to accelerate the technology, find the funding streams to get this new technology commercially available at our ports, and at the same time, keep the commerce of America moving as best we can to drive this, uh, this economy. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Thank you, Gene. This looks to be our last question, unless anything else pops in. This is for from Bill Mongaluzzo, Journal of Commerce, and it's for Steve. What are the major operational issues faced by cargo owners at the ports of LA and Long Beach, and what actions do you advise the ports and terminal operators to address these issues? Operationally, right now, uh, because the we're not seeing any disruption or, or surges. I, operationally, everything seems to be. Uh, what I'm hearing is everything seems to be working reasonably fluidly. Uh, seeing the uh, the ships moving in and out and no back backlogs uh, is great news for everybody. But I mean, we've got we've got challenges, um, not the least of which is the construct upcoming construction on the Vincent Thomas. Uh, that's going to be interesting to see what that does to uh, our trucking community. 
but uh, I've, I've got real concerns um, uh, about what Gene just mentioned, the clean fleets rule. I'm, I've got concerns on how that's going to affect our drainage community and what that will do to uh, fluidity. Um, yeah, I'm hoping that everything goes forward as, as uh, smoothly as possible, but I have concerns about that. Um, one of my biggest concerns, and it's a, it's a huge frustration for me, is what's brewing on the horizon, uh, the South Coast Air Quality Management District's Rule 2305, or the Independent Source Rule. Um, I'm, besides, I'm beside myself with frustration on this. The, you know, the, the great work that uh, both Gene and Mario have done on the Clean Air Action Plan 2.0, um, uh, what CARB's done and the EPA rules that are that have been in place. We've seen, they're first of all, they're very aggressive on reducing and eliminating port-related air pollution, and the results, of, results have been remarkable. Yet what's being proposed is going to put a cap on uh, the volume of cargo coming into our ports. And that's going to be a serious challenge for California businesses. Um, you're going to see California businesses competing for space uh, to get their products in. So uh, and my feeling is, is that this, this is uh, going to hurt uh, companies. It's going to uh, hurt employment. It's going to hurt uh, state coffers because tax revenue is going to be cut back. And most importantly, you're going to see a lot of cargo that's diverted to other ports. And what does that do? You're going to end up with more pollution shifting over to other ports and across the nation uh, because they haven't taken the long way around. So this is something that really, really uh, scares me. But last, last comment. We, we've got a pretty stable situation right now. But no matter what people think, disruption is always around the corner. And when we get disruption and these huge surges in volume at the ports, that's when the real problems uh, arise. And the data initiatives that we're pushing uh, at, uh, at the uh, FMC and uh, what the great work that Commissioner Bensel's doing and then the flow initiative out of uh, Department of Transportation and your work there at the Port of LA in Long Beach, um, We've got to get the, the data flowing so we've got better visibility on everything to make sure that when we do have this next disruption come, whatever it may be, we've got the visibility of everything and we can plan accordingly. And that scares the, the heck out of our industry. Thank you, Steve. Gene, I'll turn it back to you. Steve, really appreciate you joining us today. And, and uh, again, as a friend, you're doing so much for our industry. And as you rightly said, the next issue is around the corner, but it's this network of people like you that we can count on to keep working through the issues and getting the job done for our customers and the American consumers. So thanks for joining us, man, and have a great Thanksgiving. Gene, if I can make one more comment. Sure. Um, I would, I'd like to ask, uh, make a request of our listeners uh, out there. I would ask everyone in our industry, BCOs, carriers, ports, terminals, et cetera, et cetera, to get involved in watching and commenting on what the, the National Shipper Advisory Committee is doing. We would love to see more input from all of the various stakeholders. And lastly, an announcement. Um, it hasn't been formally announced yet, but our Q1, our uh, uh, National Shipper Advisory Committee next, uh, uh, next year, uh, our Q1 meeting will be held at TPM. Um, so anyone attending TPM will have an opportunity to uh, attend the meeting and comment. Date and time to be announced shortly, but I highly recommend people come and sit in on the committee, committee meeting. Oh, that's fantastic. We'll, uh, we'll certainly whip up a crowd for that and, and bring some of the other uh, uh, experts in our industry to, to help you guys and ladies out. That's awesome, Steve. Thanks. Thanks again, Gene. Appreciate just being here. Thank you. And finally, today I'd like to touch on the importance of international collaboration in boosting global trade, combating climate change, and improving supply chain efficiency. These three aspects, to me, are all closely interrelated. And given the magnitude of these issues, it's crucial for leaders in the maritime industry and beyond 
to come together to innovate and find solutions. A critical venue for these topics is the International Association of Ports and Harbors, or IAPH, a global organization of 177 ports from 84 countries around the world. Earlier this month, I was back in the United Arab Emirates for the IAPH World Ports Conference. It was a great honor for me to accept the voluntary position of Vice President for the North America region in this association. Under the visionary leadership of Jens Meyer, the incoming IAPH President and CEO of the Hamburg Port Authority, we'll collaborate with colleagues around the world to address various important issues, such as sustainability, workforce development, and supply chain improvements. The IAPH is an ideal platform for facilitating collaboration, problem solving, and sharing best practices within the port industry. And speaking of collaboration, this week I also had the opportunity to attend the Asia Pacific Ep Economic Cooperation CEO Summit in San Francisco. This event brings together world leaders from the Asia Pacific region, 21 countries were represented to promote dialogue on the global opportunities and challenges that shape economic, environmental, and societal trends. At this year's conference, many world-renowned CEOs were featured and spoke to the central theme of economic opportunity and, equi and equitable growth. I was honored to be a panelist in the Sustainable Future Forum, an APEC-affiliated event focused on environmental and sustainable solutions. Along with executives from Federal Express and Deloitte, our panel engaged in discussions on the importance of cross-border collaboration in implementing sustainable initiatives. While at the APEC Summit, Los Angeles Harbor Commission President Lee Williams and I were pleased to participate in the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding with officials from Vietnam. We've agreed to share best practices on supply chain digitalization and environmental initiatives with Vietnam's Long Son International Port Project. Here, the long-term goal is to establish yet another green shipping corridor between our two ports. Ultimately, all these efforts culminate in an unwavering global commitment to confront and address the most critical environmental challenges of our time. From leading on initiatives such as the Green Shipping Corridors to partnering on the future of hydrogen and sharing insights on cybersecurity along with digitalization, we are at the forefront of global cooperation. And it's with great pride that I represent the Port of Los Angeles in these and other endeavors. In closing, I'd like to wish you all a wonderful, safe, and happy Thanksgiving holiday. Enjoy the time. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you back here again next month.